All right, guys, welcome back to the show. Uh, big one today, very, very excited. I think most of you probably know um, based upon uh, the interactions that we've had on Instagram. Actually, no, Paulie, that's wrong, isn't it? Because depending on when the show comes out, this might be a long time ago. So, guys, welcome to the future. <laughs> <laughs> Paulie, mate, how are you? I'm doing very well. We do have a few shows backed up, so we'll be dripping them out over the summer holidays. Speaking of summer and uh, beautiful weather, my friend, you have abandoned the dark and gloomy, rainy climate that is in Victoria for brighter, greener pastures uh, in Queensland. Uh, it feels good. I feel, I feel a little bit more brown, a little tanned, so, so that's quite nice. And, uh, no, we're loving it up here in Gold Coast. Um, so, uh but it hasn't, you know, not too much of an issue. We're, we're still talking over Zoom. We're still, we're still friends, I think. <laughs> Maybe this is what we need to work through today. <laughs> no, but very much looking forward to this chat and uh, good to see a new, new setup as well over in Queensland, mate. Yeah, thank you, mate. No, well, let's, um, let's get into it. And, um, you know, um, we, we were speaking before, Lissy, about, um, you know, how, how I um, came across you. I came across your book. Firstly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. And, you know, Paulie and I are just really, really excited to, to pick your brain for today. Oh, thank you both for having me. It's great to be here and to meet you in person. Yeah, well, what we'll do is um, I'll read um, I'll read a bit about your background for context for the listeners. And um, like I said to you again before the show, um, there's been just such a giant amount of response from um, some of the questions that people have for you, which I think speaks to um, just the, the 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 need and the demand out there for people really wanting to not only moving away from pain with regard to their relationships but wanting their relationships to thrive and and and, and be optimized so i think it's it's uh, really wonderful that, that people are doing this but let's have a listen so lissy abrahams is an individual and couples psychotherapist she was one of four candidates selected into a four-year couples psychotherapy masters in london at the world-renowned institute tavistock relationships later she tutored and lectured here Lissy returned to Sydney and founded the Sydney-based therapy clinic Heath Group Practice. Now, guys, that's not Health Group, it's Heath Group. <laughs> she works with clients around the world, has held positions on several psychotherapy associations and has published academically. Lissy is the author of Relationship Reset, which I have here, ladies and gentlemen, and it is a really, really, really good book for uh, professionals as well, by the way. You know, this is I'm a counsellor and um, personally... You know, lots of takeaways for me in my own relationship, but even to work in the couple space as well. So thank you for, for writing it the way you did. It was really great. Um, so, yeah, Lissy is the author of Relationship Reset and has a successful online course, Fight Less, Love More. She, said she shares her knowledge via interviews in newspapers, podcasts, and TV appearances. She's also on Mamma Mia's Health Expert Panel. What is Mamma Mia's Health Expert Panel, by the way? It's a group of people who are there that they can tap into and they want to in time put them out into different forums and have have uh, days and longer kind of uh, information gathering. So it's a group of people who are gathered up for particular reasons and I'm there for relationships. Love that. Awesome. Well, yeah, thanks so much for joining us on the show. No, it's great to be here. So one of the questions that we had um, that from our from our listeners, um, which I thought would be a really great one to start, was what got, I mean, psychotherapy, as we know, is just such a broad thing and there are so many different ways that you can niche down, you know, whether it's psychoanalysis and all the various aspects within psychoanalysis and everything. What drew you to relationship and couples therapy? Yeah, well, my journey to couples started many decades before my therapy training. So my mum was a family lawyer and she started training when I was 15 to become a lawyer. And by the by the time that she was out there and working, she, there were so many cases that I heard about where people were doing it really tough. Mm -hmm. And it, it really got me thinking about, what, what are we doing in these relationships? How do, how do people who start off with all of the promise in the world end up either separating some years later or absolutely annihilating each other in court processes? And 
I think I just wanted to go downstream or upstream and help people before they got to see people like my mum, who's not working at the moment, but in she's she's retired. But it just was really sad. And there were some really tragic cases of people who who were really left with quite dire predicaments post-separation. And it's just how do you go from really loving someone to absolutely hating their guts and shredding them and not caring about the children in the process? Now, I'm not saying everyone does that, but that really did resonate for me. Isn't that interesting? Because so so with your with your mum, I'm assuming what she's doing, uh, and I don't know law very well at all, to be honest with you, but she's trying to find, you know, the, the the best case scenario for both sides, perhaps, or the ones where both can win or both can come away and actually reach an agreement. Um, but working with those people after years and years and years of conflict and resentment, and, you know, it's just interesting that you've decided to go, wow, you know, treating the symptom, let's get to the root cause. And, and certainly one of the things I really took away from your book is that apart from distress tolerance, and I really love the, the tape measure analogy, I thought that was really, really powerful. But it seems to me like a lot of this sort of stuff, not only from individual childhood trauma and so forth, but a lot of it begins from little things that kind of get bottled up and swept under. And then there's also a lack of awareness as to what our needs are in those moments. And then eventually after years and years and years, it boils and bubbles into these shocking things where as you said people are taking each other to the cleanup yeah absolutely and you know some people are really great during a separation that they can have sufficient respect for each other to do it well they don't need the whole legal process to become involved they just need a lawyer who can sign off their arrangements and then the other end and that's actually really hard Mm -hmm. you have to have a huge amount of psychological maturity to be able to have a good separation And you have to be able to see your children and your ex as someone, irrespective of the reason for the separation, you have to actually see them as someone with a heartbeat who continues to have a heartbeat, not one you want to stick a knife in their heart and watch it bleed all over the streets. So it's actually, it's a huge amount of emotional maturity. And anything that's not in that realm is really hard because it's actually really hard to separate with maturity. There's a lot of untangling of every single part of life. Nearly everything needs to be turned over and examined. Is this an individual part of my life or is it was this part of my couple life that now needs changing? And so anything harder than two people who have that maturity and can do it, it just gets it just multiplies and multiplies and multiplies so that by the time people end up going to court, the children, if they've got them, are absolutely damaged by that that by that point. It is the last option and it is needed for some people but it is absolutely the last option there there is an area of um called collaborative law and it's a new a newer process in the last kind of 20 years it's been building in popularity and it's where both sides get a lawyer but the clients who become parties upon separation they have to sign a document that says with these particular lawyers they're going to resolve this matter and not take it to court And so many people who are actually signing up to that, it means we're not going to just get the shits and say, right, I'm done, I'm taking you to court now. It means you have to start your whole legal process again with a whole new lawyer and a whole new firm. So people have already invested. There's a lot. Once you're in that, it's worth your while getting the arrangements over the line. So there's just something very important about the collaborative space where people have a mindset which is we are here to resolve it not to use this as a therapy process or for showing how upset I am with you. And the lawyers actually are not necessarily advocates for their client. They're advocates for the process. And it's a really different way of resolving matters. So it's a really great model, but you still need people who can think and a willingness to resolve it. Mm. That's that's, that's super fascinating. Um, You know, (laughs) Similarly, uh, my father is a family lawyer as well. So we, we both have similar upbringings uh, in that sense and um, with that exposure to, um, you know, what what the world looks like in that sense. But what I'd love to ask you, uh, just speaking of the collaborative process versus the adversarial process, um, have you seen any commonalities in looking back retrospectively in relationships that had led in the way the couples interact with one another that have led to a more adversarial um, ending versus a more collaborative one? 
Totally. I mean, I think there's a direct correlation. We find the type of lawyer who is going to meet our mental state. Mm -hmm. So if we are angry and embittered, we are not going to want a lawyer who wants to calm everything down and work it out gently. We're going to often want that part expressed in the process. Mm -hmm. And so what, what I mean by that is if I'm angry and embittered and furious, I'm going to find a bulldog who's going to allow that expression for me through the legal process. Now, I'm not saying every single person does this, but I see it repeatedly that, and I definitely advise my clients to not go down that route um, unless they absolutely have to in a legal process that they're going to be trampled on by what's happening on the other side. And then I actually do recommend some bulldogs, not that I want to go down that, have people go there. But I see it all the time, actually, poorly, that if you're wanting to just get things done and look after the kids, then people do want that kind of lawyer who will who will facilitate that for them. Mm-hmm. It's an interesting area, the law, and I'm, I, it's great that you've you've experienced that with your dad. I think what's important here is that um, you know we're, we're very fragile <laughs> as humans. We're very easily wounded, and whatever that is, whether it's in the relationship itself or our ego gets in the way and we can't bear the thought that someone could even leave us. I mean. Mm-hmm. All, all, or that we would need to leave someone, you know, it, it, it all gets played out. It's part of the whole kind of psychodrama that, that we're in at that point. And it, it can just swallow up a whole system, which is really tragic. It, you know, one of the things that I was really um, trying to pay attention to, um, so, so just for context, one of the things I really like about your book was at the very end you're asking these questions to allow us to start to consider some of these, uh, you know, whether it's childhood trauma, like I said, or or just attachment styles, familiarity, and how these things play into our own lives. And then you're asking things like, you know, is would this be a threat for you? Do you perceive this? Do you tend to sort of respond to threat in fight or flight? You know, some some people perhaps freeze. And just watching all the ways that I can feel that kind of affect arousal, you know, as um, even just by reading. These these um, these uh, case studies, you know, um, I think one of the things that's so difficult about understanding our egos, you say ego stories, is just how subtle these things can trigger us, and then how um, that emotion then starts to play into how our behaviour changes. So, yeah. just as a segue from that, when couples are first coming to you. What are some of the typical things that you're seeing? And, um, you know, whether it's homosexual couples, heterosexual couples, is it um, one person is kind of dragging the couple to the relationship? Or, yeah, what are you, what, what are you typically saying? Uh, I can see one person dragging the other. And I'll get phone calls where people say, my partner doesn't want to come and I really want them to come. And I'll just say, look, see if they'll come for one session. Because often if people get through the door and they see that I'm not there as a threat and I'm not standing on a podium saying how amazing I am and how crap their lives are, you know, we're all in the human drama together and we're, we're all responding like this, then, then often they can, they'll, they'll sign up to more sessions because they see that it's helpful not harming them because I'm non-judgmental. So I don't mind if one person doesn't want to come in. I totally get that. I wouldn't want to go. If I didn't want to go, I wouldn't want to go (laughs) and I would protest. So I respect the protesters Um, and often they're the fortress ones. So if you think about people who have never, ever shared their internal world with anybody, they're not used to people being interested, they have to deal with everything themselves. We talk in the, I talk in the book about the fortress style of attachment. They're not used to people who want to know about how they're doing. They just fix it all up inside and turn bits off and get on with it. So, of course, they're going to be dragged into therapy and their clingy other type of partner is going to say, you've got to come, you've got to come because I want to talk about all of this. And so the protesters are going, no, leave me alone. Let me just do my thing. It works this way. So I really do respect that that's their position. Um, Sometimes people come in and they're just very sad about the state of the relationship. For some people, they come in and they're at ground zero. I really like that. I know it sounds mean, but I really like it because it means they're really going to give it a go. They're not kind of just standing around the edges, you know, thinking that this is just a little fluffy thing. It's like, oh, now I get what's on the line here. I could lose my family. 
I could lose my in-laws, my house. That's up, that's going to be up for grabs because most people have to sell a family home. Um, we might need to change neighbourhoods. So there's everything to lose. And I quite like when people, I don't want people there, but if they're coming in at that point, we can really get down to work. I'd love to, so we've been shining a light on, on the conflict uh, side of things, which I think is super important because everyone, you know, in a relationship would have experienced this at, at some point in their journey. Um, I'd love to kind of reverse engineer this back to um before somebody steps into a relationship, uh, I'm just, I've guided a lot of um, fathers through the health and well-being process, uh, through exercise, nutrition, mental uh, insights, lifestyle design, all, all, all the rest of it. But what I've seen commonly is men uh, experiencing life as a bachelor, independent, uh, being the centre of their own universe and then coupling up needing to share their universe with uh, a significant other. And then once they, uh, you know, migrate into the family, wider family sphere, then once again, giving of themselves even more. And I I feel there's this sense of loss that is experienced uh, during each of these transitional processes. Um, Obviously gain at the same time as loss, but there's, there's um, there's a sense of being lost as well uh, because they can't really navigate the process step by step. So I'd love for you to be able to speak to that and how um, you've experienced being able to guide people through these processes. I think you're raising a really critical part about what happens to people in relationships. I see it with men and women uh, about a sense of loss, the loss of the individual self. And I don't think enough attention is placed on that area so when we do join up with someone we do go into a place that forms the us and the we and what happens to that the individual yearning what happens to our longings in life just because we've met someone where do they all go our wants and desires and they can't all be met in a relationship they absolutely can't and as as all of the processes stack up and life gets more and more serious there's a lot less space for that you know you throw in a kid or two you tell me a man who's got a lot of free time or a woman everyone's stretched they're burdened many are getting burnt out these days um so i just i think that there that we live with a loss and the and that's the loss of the individual self we, we don't make room for it, and especially when we have young kids. It's kind of like, how dare you think of going and having that time, you know, when I'm exhausted? Mm. How can you even think of going off and doing that, having nights off when I just need to put my head down? And it's very real for, for both people in the relationship. But I think it's I, one of the things I encourage my couples, especially when they've had young kids, is how do you make sure that there's room for you as an individual? Because if that, if you can fill that cup up, you can bring so much more back into your relationship, your own life, your work, whatever, wherever you go. We need to remember that our partner wasn't put on this earth for us. They're separate. We met a completely separate human being who wasn't who wasn't destined to be our partner we might have met someone on a holiday like my couple in the book you know they met on a holiday in the mountains yes we meet someone and it, it's not like oh goodness you're the only person in the world I could ever have been with I mean really that's a very limited mindset when people think that 7.8 billion people I reckon I could find a few partners in that so <laughs> but they're not they're not here just for us and if we can remember that every person in a relationship have their they have their own individual self that needs to develop, be nourished in the way they want to do it. And we're not going to always get alignment in that. My partner and I are really, really different people. We're really different. And we're continuously having to navigate the differences between us and how and and how I get my individual self nourished, which I'm very good at, by the way. <laughs> I've learned <laughs> after all these years. Um, but it's just it, it's a continuous kind of navigation, and we must never take ourselves as, as an individual off the agenda ever. 
Well, let, let's, let's stay there. So, so that is obviously a really important dichotomy, you know, um, the individual with the, the, the weeness, as you say, um, and, and making sure that we don't um, become too out of whack either by being too individualistic and just being self-centered and narcissistic, but also losing our own sense of self in the relationship. What are some tools that people can take away even just right now if they start to feel either that they've lost themselves entirely in the relationship or that due to perhaps having that kind of fortress mentality, um, they are struggling to open up in the relationship? So. I suppose the question is related how to managing that dichotomy. Well, there's always going to, well, there's nearly always going to be someone in a relationship who's going to be the spokesperson. There's usually going to be one person who will describe what they're not that happy with. Listen to them. Mm. You know, unless they're a complete winter and that's all they like to do, which I doubt. There's often a kernel in there of something that's not quite right something that's missing, some, something that just feels off kilter. And I, th- I often say to people, take it really seriously because if we're just dismissing our partner's concerns, th- that just then steps it into, into the foundation of the relationship. So if someone's not being nourished enough, as a team work out, what do you need? Mm-hmm. How can I help you? Who do we need to call in? You know, for a lot of people, having children, um, adds so much to the plate. That's why a lot of kids, aren't, a lot of young people aren't having kids anymore. <laughs> um, they've seen us do it and they haven't been that impressed with us. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just continuously remembering that this tension between being an individual and a team and being a couple have to both be managed. And then there's a family unit if you have children. But it's, it's, it's have meetings about it, have chats about it, don't ever let it get off the agenda because it's a continuous tension that it will, you'll never get the perfect spot. It, it's going to move weekly, mm. daily, annually. So you just have to keep re-navigating yourself into different places as needed. Mm. Makes complete sense that it's, you know, we're, we're fluid beings, hence our relationships are going to be completely fluid as well. So if you find a point in time where you and your partner and your, your family even uh, are content or satisfied or thriving even, um, and then a month from that time uh, something comes up, it's perfectly natural. Everything is going to be uh, continuously evolving and problems are going to arise um, because we're all individuals and we're all going to be uh, changing, moving and being fluid. And uh, that can be a difficult conversation to have because one person might be like hang on we were just fine a second ago what's your problem (laughs) absolutely and I was actually thinking as you were also saying that for a lot of people when they're fine that's when the space comes up for something else it's kind of Mm -hmm. like when you go for a walk you can get ideas when things are fine and you're not sort of putting out fires all the time it opens up the door for well is there something else Mm -hmm. Do I really want to go um, hiking in Tasmania and my partner doesn't? What do I want to do about that? Mm. Do we want to use these resources for X, not Y? The, the thoughts come in in the peacetime. So I wouldn't be surprised when people do kind of rock the boat a little when it's peaceful. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, uh, and, I mean, even just hearing you say that, that kind of makes sense because well, would I also be right in saying that when you are both physiologically relaxed, that's probably a good time to bring up some of these conflicting conversations because there's not all of that weight in the boat as well, where it's like you can put a little bit on, the, the boat's still going to still gonna manage a little bit of that conflict. But if you're really stressed, it's like a little mouse goes on and everything falls apart. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's – oh, sorry, Paula, you go, man. <laughs> I just wanted to speak really, really quickly to the, the, the next stage in life. And I'm going to be a little bit selfish here in that, um, you know, the complexity that you've described in uh, children coming into the mix. What commonalities have you found uh, or um, have you seen any amplifications of certain conflicts that may have arisen uh, previously that that continue to rise and amplify once uh, kids come into the mix or new, brand new kind of conflicts that have, have arised as well? Yeah, I think that that is um, an exceptional question because we can still have our day-to-day niggles 
you know, we can have our day-to-day conflict, but when children come on board, it changes the dynamic because both partners will feel like they're working in the best interest of their children. I'm just mm. going to give you a really simple example, and it will sound a little bit petty, but it really mattered to me. So my husband and I, and here's my example, we had different temperatures. <laughs> you know, men and women, we can have really different temperatures. So I would then see my children when he would take them out as not being warm enough. And it really distressed me, the thought that my kids who couldn't yet walk or they had little boot, tiny little booties and we were living in London. So I'd be quite freaked out thinking they're not warm enough. They need an extra layer. And he'd be like, no, they're fine because he was fine. But mm-hmm. who's right? We can't actually say. Um, they mm-hmm. never returned to blue or needed hospitalisation. But it was just something that always stuck with me about me believing that I knew what was best for them and him believing that he knew what was best. So we're not really talking about right or wrong, but it's that it's the way that we experience the world and we then impose that filter onto our children so everything becomes more heightened. Like, yeah. did I really want to spend my time talking about another layer of clothing? Probably not. But it, and there were many, all, you know, we can all have lots of those sorts of things, but we can see the world in a particular way and we're going to then overlay that with our expectations in relationships for our children, how they're going to be raised, how they're going to be educated. And, boy, it's a game changer in a, in a relationship because we don't know what's coming. We think we've had all these conversations before having kids. We have no idea how small these things will be. One person might be really routine. Another might be really kind of casual about that. Let them stay up longer. And then one says, no way, they've got to go to bed because I need my tomorrow to be okay. I'm exhausted. So, but I haven't seen them all day. <laughs> and Let, all Let's sit up. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, Lucy. I, 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 I wanted to just start it. Like, oh. <laughs> I know, I was getting excited as well. But, like, you know, I would imagine that a, a, a deeply fluid person and a routine person, for some reason, opposites, and you could probably speak to this as well. Opposites do kind of be, become drawn together. And let's use like a, a deeply routined person who has structure in their life and a fluid person who relies a little bit on spontaneity. Have you come up with uh, strategies or um, ways to hold the space for them to be able to meet in the middle when it comes to guiding their kids or, or, or their lives in general? That question, I'm going to just zoom it right out and take it away from even people having it about kids. If we want to know what is behind every argument, there's fear in some way. Mm. Okay. So what is the fear in that moment? For me, it was fear that my kids would be too cold and they couldn't even talk yet and wouldn't know what how to ask to get another jumper on. What is the fear about someone who's really routine and someone who's not is the fear that the person who's routine is controlling them, is the fear that the person who's spontaneous is not really caring about the the kid's well-being, then then we keep repeating these scenes in different areas of parenting or in life as a couple and we actually start to think of our partner as someone who's not up to scratch. Mm. So someone who's really routine, we might start to think of them as someone who's Um, snuffing out life forces for us they're just stifling us in a way and controlling us whereas someone who say fair and doesn't want doesn't believe in the kids having to have these strict routines now just look at asia by the way they don't care about that that's not their thing their kids are up till 10 11 and you know a lot of them doing really well so we do something that puts a rule in here but that kind of parenting might make someone think they don't care they don't care about the children if they're cold they don't care if they're up late they don't care about their education the next day but it's not true that they don't care they just have a very different model so what happens mm. if they could start losing they could start to lose trust in their partner as somebody who has got this how do I trust you? How do I go away for a weekend? What are you going to do with the kids? You're not going to care properly. You're not watching their needs. And so it's not just the one argument or the one fight here or there. It's what happens over time where you've gone from someone you've met and trusted and think is pretty fantastic enough. You know, I can see their strengths and weaknesses, but they're pretty fantastic enough. Over time, when we lose trust or we find they're stifling our life force and want to put us in a little routine box, we can build these stories that, may, that are quite negative 
Mm. And then we go from seeing them as someone pretty wonderful who you want to hang out with to someone who's actually not good enough. And that's where the language mm. about them changes, our behaviour towards them changes. We might get triggered by them really quickly because we're seeing them and perceiving them as a threat. So it's re- it's what happens over and over and over again in all of these different areas. Lisa, so how do we break that? Oh, sorry, sorry Tom. I, want, I, I just would be keen. Yeah, you're probably asking the, the, the next steps of that. So if we've got this snowball effect that nobody is really probably consciously aware of developing this within their own minds and almost like developing a completely different person mm-hmm. and representation of their partner to what, you know, they had previously in their own mind and then when they come home from work or um, their, their partner, they, they meet their partner in the evening, they're like, who is this person? <laughs> and and nothing has actually changed from the um, the way the person acts, just the way the perception is. How do we come to, a, 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 not a resolution, but um, to a meeting of the minds to be able to kind of dissolve this, this tension, so to speak? Yeah, we have to, there's several things here. And this is where we, we're, we're blind to all of this. We really don't know. And that's why I wrote the book. We actually don't know why we're wired in the way we are. So we are we are all wired up. We're ba- it's based on all of our experiences we had. We're wired to be in relationships by 12 to 18 months of age. So we think this is just me, but it's not actually me as I chose to be. And that's for anyone in a relationship. It's who I ended up as based on the environment I grew up in, my parents, grandparents, the stories of my family, my siblings, school teachers, school friends, not friends, people who didn't like me. We're just shaped. And then we go, oh, that's me, as if I chose me. I didn't. And so responding in the world without actually knowing how I'm wired up or how anyone's wired up is really dangerous. Because we just keep imposing our usness, <laughs> our reality on other people and expecting that they will follow suit. But nobody likes to be controlled like that. Nobody wants someone imposing their version on them. And that's what partners in relationships do all the time. We can do it at work to a greater or lesser degree. Friends can do this. But we see it in the most intense form in a couple relationship. So how do we do it? We have to understand what our blind spots are. We need to know how we're wired because if we don't know how we're wired, we're going to treat our our way as a fact, that the way I operate is the way to be because this is how it was always done and my mum was like this, my dad, however it was, we just treat it like this is it. But we've been shaped and we can be unshaped into and shaped into another version of ourselves and it's it's work but it's worth it. So we need to understand that. We need to understand our triggers. What is that fear behind our difference? What's the fear? Because we keep playing it out and the more we're going to play out, you're a threat to me, then we are going to be going into fight or flight and that does so much damage repeatedly in relationships. What what do we say in a fight? What do we call our partner? What do we tell them about it then? What tool do we kind of hurl at them and go, or weapon, you know, those spanners or weapons or whatever it is, do we start blaming them? Do we go global? Do we start telling them how they're, you know, really, you know, have a small penis? Whatever it is, we can be mean. Or we can be frightened and run out of the house and, um, you know, go and tell all our friends what a creep we're with. But really, is it all that bad or is it because we've we've been triggered? But it's not always our partner's fault that we've been triggered. It's ours. Our triggers are our own. Yeah, because they weren't there. They weren't in our lives. They were doing something else, growing up somewhere else, when we were forming. My my my, my partner's not responsible for my triggers, and nor are yours. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's me is mine. One of the things that um, I really love, and I I hope that's not diminishing in value, because I've said that a couple of times. Um, I love. Keep loving. <laughs> Spreading love. <laughs> Now, honestly, one thing um, that I I probably was probably the thing I enjoyed most about your book was a very, very small sentence. Um, And you said, um, and this is not verbatim, but um, paraphrasing, you said, I used to think that in relationships, um, it was right for each couple to take 50%. uh, And now I don't agree with that. I think it's right that each couple should take 100% responsibility. Um, Could you elaborate on that? Because that was that was really powerful for me. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard it so many times that people feel like they don't want to be blamed in the relationship for where the relationship is. So they like to kind of shove blame and project it back onto their partner because their ego can't tolerate um, being imperfect in any way, you know, and that's a survival reason and I won't go into that in this second. But when this is the, the point about 100%, we really are, we don't, we're not responsible for how we're wired but we're responsible for all of the actions of our wiring. Yeah. So we're not responsible for how we've been shaped and what happened to us as children. That that happened. But we're responsible for what happens that impacts other people. Mm -hmm. And so for me, if I want to, if I want to really be in the world in my integrity, one of the things is I need to be fully responsible for what I do that impacts other people. So if I've done something that's hurt someone, caused them frustration, I'm going to apologise for that. I'm not waiting to dole out 50% of the blame to them to say, you know, here's an example this morning, I accidentally took my partner's keys. He ran around that house going, where are my keys? Where are my keys? And I'm going, I don't know, thinking smugly, you'll have to work this out. And then later I did the text of shame going, I'm really sorry. Now that's just such a small one, but it's like my pride didn't want to tell him. And it's so small and I had a laugh at myself, but then I just sent a message saying, you're going to love this one, you need to sit down. And he said, I said, I'm going to sit down. And then, so the text went backward and forward and, he, and I told him with like horrified emojis. But we have to own it all. And it, the little stuff and the big stuff, we just have to own it so that we're not just treating our partner as a punching bag. And if I can 100% own my actions and my apologies and any ruptures that I've caused, then I'm inviting my partner to do the same. I can't expect that they'll do it every time, but I can only be responsible for me. I can't do them and me. I, I'm not that skilled. So 100% responsible for ourselves and all our great parts are ours, but so are our other bits that we can keep working on. And do, do you see that as well? Do you see like say in a therapeutic session when when one partner does does take that 100% respo- responsibility, does that um, evoke a kind of like a de-escalatory situation where the other one can then be invited to do the same? Absolutely. And now, look, they don't always because our ego will only let us apologise when we're really able to. Yep. And that we can only take responsibility when we've calmed ourselves down. Uh, if we're not calm, we're not going to do it and it'll be inauthentic. So I say never apologise unless you mean it. Like yep. I will never give a false apology only when I really mean it. That might take a few weeks sometimes. Seriously, depends how angry I am about something or hurt, whatever that is. I might forget about it and then come back to it later. But yep. You know, it does because it's saying to someone, I respect you enough to put myself aside and say, I can see that I've impacted you. Mm. I'm not waiting for an apology. I'm saying, I see that I've impacted you. I've hurt you. Mm. That wasn't cool what I said. I stepped over a line. I shouldn't have done that. Or I disregarded you in that moment or I talked over you and didn't give a shit. So I am sorry for that. Mm. So it does something that just says, I see you. Now, Anyone with anyone who's been on the planet long enough knows that what we really want from our parents and from our partner is to be seen and accepted for who we are. We don't want to be shaped and molded and pushed and um, told what to wear, what to, how to be, when to shut our mouths. We want to just be accepted for the being that we are. When we apologize, we're we're, we're saying this is who I am, and I'm sorry for that. I've affected you. But we also want to let them know that we accept them for who they are. So it's important to kind of meet their apology and not say with big egos, no, I, you know, <laughs> I don't accept it. You're not, you know, <laughs> you're still a wanker and you're small and whatever. You know, we don't want to do that. <laughs> so it it is, there is something that when we are seen and we're validated and we've hurt someone and they go, oh, it matters that I hurt you and I'm sorry, we can all just breathe differently. And then there is that does that does kind of create that safer environment and trust actually it's how we restore trust mm. yeah it's such a it's it's such an in, uh, like you speaking about it now uh makes so much sense but going through the process being in the conflict at the time in the heat of the moment uh when all your defense mechanisms are up and you want to protect what is so rightly yours being your opinion and your upbringing and uh, uh, your, your truth at the time. Um, it's such a difficult 
thing to imp- uh, to impose this kind of um, st- strategy and philosophy that you're talking about. Are there any uh, speaking of strategies? Are there any strategies that you can offer when this this defense mechanism is coming up for somebody and they want to be able to defend what is going on inside of them. Is there anything that you can offer that can kind of disarm the situation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing anybody in that state needs to do is calm the hell down. We just can't think. Our our thinking capacities have gone offline. We're just reacting. So we're not responding to a situation. We're just reacting. Mm -hmm. And Fight or flight, it's really, you know, and there's also faint and um, fawn and freeze, but we're really just talking about fight or flight with couples mostly. That's a two option. That's just a two option reaction. I'm either going to fight you or I'm going to run away from you. And sometimes we do both. I can do both. But that doesn't mean we're actually responding or we're being thoughtful or we're we're using our frontal lobes of our brain. They've actually gone off, they've gone offline so that our um, limbic system and our fight or flight can just take over. So we really need to just calm down. So that means mm. the break, we have to pause. Nothing will ever be resolved in shouting something out to each other or sulking in another room. It's not going to get resolved like that. So we need to go away and we need to manage ourselves. And what I really say is we really need to go away because that just allows us to breathe. Go and do some breathing in another room. You know, something as simple as um, what's five, 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 sec- five seconds in, um, five seconds hold, five seconds out and repeat five times. So that's just through your nose and you can in through your nose and out through your mouth. We need to calm ourselves down and our vagus nerve will take over and help do that. Then we come back with a spirit of wanting to clean it up together. And if we're not in that place, then just keep separated until you're ready to join up again. Because have you ever been in a fight where you're really upset with your partner and you're saying things to each other and you never do this and you've done this and how about this one? Or, uh, you know, everyone's got their own particular flavour and someone goes, my goodness, you're right. (laughs) Right, that's a good point. (laughs) We never resolved in that space because... The, the frontal lobes have gone offline. They're wanting to come back online, so they want to come back and help us think. They want to know that it's safe enough to resume thinking. But it's not going to happen if we're still going. So that's where the pause is really important. But we do have to sort of set a time and come back because I know when couples leave each other for three hours and don't come back, they just feel really awful and that gets into it that they're not even interested in, in resolving something. Now, I don't think every fight needs resolution. I think if we can locate it, hey, I just had to think about it and I can see that I got triggered because, you know, when you said this, I felt like it was just really upsetting, reminded me of X, Y and Z. That's when we've done enough work. But we really do need to know our blind spots so we can have those conversations. But behind it all is fear. There's fear. I love that. Fear of being disrespected, fear of not being trustworthy, fear of um, someone being more powerful than us fear that they're going to spend all our money. Fear. I mean, there's lots of fears, uh, but we just have to understand it's still fear-based. That's why we've gone off. Or yeah. gone away. Well, Lizzie, let's, um, let's get to some of the questions um, because, uh, you know, like I said um, at the beginning of the show, we had to kind of bring this down to the top 10. Uh, we had a lot of people that wanted to uh, pick your brain. Um, so hopefully we can, we can, we can do, uh, do the listeners some good here. But uh, one of the ones that I thought was really interesting um, was one of our listeners has said, um, if one partner says they're in trouble with the other, how do we end parent-child language? I thought that was a really interesting one um, that, uh, I'd, yeah, I'd love for you to elaborate on. So one of the things with that, I do see a lot of couples where one is kind of the one in trouble and that parent-child relating, it's got a, it's got a yucky element to it because somewhere in each of their histories, these two individuals know about parent-child relationships and they've, they've had an experience that hasn't gone so well. So what can happen is the pet, they're actually two sides of the same coin. So if you can imagine you've got a five-cent piece, on one side you've got the queen and the other side you've got an echidna, right? One coin though. So if one, pet, one, one you've got the person who say the head coming in as a child and the other, the echidna, is coming as a parent figure, they're actually playing out a part of the same dynamic. They're connected. Mm. You can only have a parent if you have a child. 
Mm. You have a child if there's a parent dynamic. So something's being played out where they both need to do some work to understand what is it that's creating this dynamic. What is the one of the one? What was one of is one of them being a parent because they don't want to feel vulnerable and small? Are they feeling overwhelmed and that the other partner isn't supporting them properly? And they're, they're taking up a kind of authoritarian, annoyed, disapproving position. Is the child one, um, are they always in trouble because that's what they're used to? And they're scrambling. I often look at those couples and I do want to just put one thing out that for the person who is the child, who is actually not a child, who's probably doing all sorts of things in real life that are nothing like a child, they might just have some struggles and overwhelmed parts, always just read the criteria for ADHD because I see that a lot where the child is is someone who doesn't who who often feels like um, they're not quite pulling their weight in a way that one would assume they would. I see that a lot, and it just opens up the question of whether there's ADHD, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, mm. and that can be definitely you know there there are ways to help people if that's the case, but it has to be looked at. That dynamic is really tricky because it's very unsexy. Nobody wants to have sex with their parent. And no, unless you talk to Freud, um, nobody wants to have sex with a child uh, and in with a, in a child figure, or and so it gets nasty. And for those couples, I would say get into some therapy, read the book, do some work, read up about that dynamic because there's something that's off kilter. But you need to you need to work it out of your system. It will not go away. It will ruin the relationship over time. Okay, so individual therapy is as well as the couple therapy. Um, I would firstly look at ADHD as a possibility, um, but I I think it depends. If the person who's um, being called a child actually can see some areas that they have some vulnerabilities and aren't as strong, they may do the individual work for that if they can see that the, the parent um, has an parent in inverted commas, has a case to be made. Otherwise, I'd go to couples therapy to understand what is it in both of them? Uh, what are they both contributing to this? what's actually happening. So mm. it, there's definitely work there. They, this will not go away by itself, I promise you. Mm. Beautiful. Okay. Tommy, Tommy, should we go one for one when it comes to the questions? And uh, uh, Should I? What do you think, Tommy? <laughs> I was just yeah, say, yeah. questions up on Trello. Yeah, 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 exactly. Go for it, my friend. Yeah, 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 too easy. Um, I'd love to talk about the like the, um, the insights into the masculine and, and feminine dynamics and how these also relate to uh, to gay couples. It's a really interesting one. In my work, I don't really focus on the masculine and feminine, and I know that a lot of a lot of people talk about it. There's a lot written about it outside online, so it's actually not something that I put onto my radar that often, because. Mm-hmm. Quite often, I feel like I feel like masculine and feminine. This might be outrageous to say, a bit awkward for some people to hear. It can feel like a little bit of a role. It can be. It, it, it might be a part of a story that we have to be a particular way. So I know at different stages for me that I can move in more masculine, more feminine, more masculine. It just depends on where I am. But I don't actually attach a lot um, of weight to it in my consulting room. Because I really am looking at, um, you know, is there? I'd be looking at what's the story attached to that. Not to say that I'm not trying to pathologize it at all, but it's just not my focus. Yeah, I think that's really, really. I I would agree with that too. And I think it even more broadly, it probably speaks to just the power of labels. You know, if you have someone who is like, oh, perhaps I need to be a little bit more. I know for me, I, I have very much feminine psychology. You know, I'm interested. In, you know, speaking to what the nature of the feminine (laughs) is, you know, my mind is very interested in ideas and people and relating and so forth. Um, But if I were to really become attached to that label, I'd be like, Oh God, maybe I need to become a little bit more, you know, and it, it, it evokes that kind of uncertainty around who I am. So that, that really makes a lot of sense. I can see how people might, yeah, like I said, really become attached to those ideas. Yeah, and it's a funny one because sometimes when I hear, when I hear people talk about it, it makes me even think, because I don't think that I think, oh, do I need to wear more blouses and things like that? 
<laughs> I understand what you're saying. I go, do I need to wear florally or flouncy outfits? And and I don't. I'm not like that. Um, but it, it, it is interesting because there's a kind of pull to it, but it isn't. It isn't on my register. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's do uh, let's do one more here, and I'm, I'm apologising to everyone whose questions we didn't get to. Um, and you know, Paulie and I were probably a bit selfish because hey, it's our podcast, so fuck you all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. let's, um, let's, uh, let's have a look here. So, um, where's one more? Okay, so so what about this one? So, um, how to navigate fear of the future in a relationship? What a great question. I guess the question is, what is the fear? And if you don't have that answer, I imagine there. But is there a fear of the future because there's something in the present that doesn't feel comfortable enough, safe enough? Now, that doesn't mean it's necessarily about your partner. It could be, what is to ask the question, what is it about me that might not feel secure in this relationship? Because the way I look at relationships, it's, that two people are in something and they put up a mirror for each other about ourselves. And so I'm always thinking about what is it about me that doesn't like this about my partner because that's about me. So then I try and work with that part in myself. So I have a partner who works really, really late at night, but that's meant I've had to change my thinking around what does it mean he's late, he's not home for dinner in this way. Now I actually couldn't care less because I worked through that fear and think because I used to think oh we'll grow apart what will it mean but now it's like wow I get to do all this stuff by myself and I can read and I can I have a whole life and go out and do what I want and it's opened up a whole new thing so for, for this listener I'd really be questioning what is the origin of the fear is it a current fear what what is that fear for the future that you've got is it that they might cheat on you if that's the case what's your history with being cheated on yeah there might be a fear of the future because in the present you might not fear that feel like your partner's got you front and centre of mind enough. Now, that doesn't mean they have to be attached to you all the time, but they might not hold you properly in mind in a particular way and that might make you feel insecure. So the question is what is the fear? I always think, though, the future is so uncertain. We actually don't know anything about the future. We really don't. We, we're guessing we're making it up, we're dreaming, we're playing fantasy. We have no idea what the future looks like really. We can plan on us that we can do that, but I would just keep looking at what is that quality now, what's unsettling you about the future now and try and address that. Mm, brilliant. Well, Paulie, should we go one more? We've probably got time for one more. Well, okay, let's let, let's do that because uh, I... I did want to ask the question that I've asked a lot of guests in the past, but um, I'll start with one from the audience, which was um, have you got, uh, do any like teachers of yours come to mind and any books or resources that that have influenced you and your learning and teachings uh, come to mind that you share with uh, the people listening to the show? Oh, that's awesome. So I, I did a psychoanalytic psychotherapy training. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to do that, but there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of info online as well. But I actually think that if we can understand the ego defense mechanisms, that, that there's, I've got this in my book, but there's lots of um, info around about this. But it's how, what do we do when we're, when we're scared, when we're wanting to avoid a situation how do we operate? So anything that's going to open up that question of how, what do we do inside of our own mind? Um, mm. Do we use denial? Do we justify ourselves? Do we look for external, external excuses? Do we project stuff onto others? That is really key. Um, mm. There's another book out at the moment which is really fabulous. It's Gabor Mate. He's amazing. And it's um, The Myth of Normal. And it's a book about trauma. And I think it's an excellent book. I'm enjoying that enormously at the moment. Another book that I highly rate is um, Eckhart Tolle's book. It's um, The Power of Now. And also Michael Singer, he's got a book, oh, what's his book called? The Untethered Soul. Now, the reason I love these books, they write, they're, they're very similar, but they write them differently. It really is about being present. So that might speak to the last listener's phone co uh, question about the future, uh, about understanding how we tell stories in the present. For me, that just absolutely changed my life. When I realised that everything that was going on in my head was actually a construction, I felt such freedom 
in my inside of myself to say that's not true. Ha, huh, that's an interesting one. Have a laugh at myself. The minute we can laugh at our laugh with ourselves, not judge ourselves, not judge others, that just changes our outlook on life. And then we have a shared humanity. So I think you know anything in those kind of areas, fantastic. Right. Uh, so something uh, that, that that I always like to ask is: Is there something that you can think of that uh, individuals and couples alike could implement into their lives, like today? Something that they could think about, uh, have a conversation about, start to really spark some ideas to go down the path that could start to develop their own selves and relationships? I think it's everything we're talking about today. It's how do we free ourselves from our own suffering? And we are suffering. We're suffering inside of ourselves. We suffer in our friendships at times, a lot of pressure on relationships in general. We suffer at work. We suffer with our children because they're not doing what we want them to do and they're not you know, going to bed as we want them to be or they said, you're a poo-poo head, I hate you. We suffer because we're taking these parts of ourselves so seriously. And when we stop looking at ourselves as the center of the universe and taking ourselves that seriously, we can actually free ourselves up and give everyone else the space to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I, if there's one thing, it's that everyone just do the work. Free yourself mm -hmm. from the suffering that is your own mind. You know, there's a lot of people who create a lot of drama inside their own mind. We all can do that, but it's a fabulous story. It may have no fact. And I, I once heard someone say, Whatever doesn't get taken, when, when, you, when we die and we're in the grave, whatever disappears with us is a story. Mm -hmm. Whatever's left is a fact. So if we think about how much of our day-to-day -day lives will die with us because it's a story and it's not actually a thing, we might really start thinking about what we're creating in our minds. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. That's very liberating. <laughs> yeah. So I want everyone to liberate. That's why I do this work and I want I want everyone to, to, to see what they're doing, to become less judgmental. It's the most liberating thing to just see we're all in it together, that we're all actually yep. the same. We're all little egos, balls of energy saying, I'm hurt, I'm hurt, and this is how I do it. Here's my particular flavour. So if we learn that, then we go, oh, there you are again. Interesting. I don't have to attach to that. I don't have to suffer. And so... Mm -hmm. That would be my one thing for everybody is to do the work. Get interested in operating. I love that. Totally. So where can, we, where can we find you online, Lissy? So I have a website, which is lissyabrahams.com, and I've got some podcasts and some TV interviews there and some blogs. I've got a newsletter. Come join the community. I look forward to seeing you both in there. Um, and feel free, people can feel free to email me at lissyabrahams.com. So, yeah, keep in touch, everyone. Yeah, fantastic. Well, it's such a such a pleasure to, to have you on, um, Lissy. Like I said, you know, when I came across the book, um, Paulie and I will often um, – tell each other the guests that we really this is one of the reasons why we both love doing the show together aside from being great mates outside of it is we come from two different perspectives and he's like paulie's like oh you're gonna try this one oh we're gonna speak to this one so it's really fantastic and thank you so much for saying yes um the book was really really great um and um it's uh it's definitely something that i'll, I'll jump back into as well because there was a lot of information that i feel like when you read a book you know you're getting 10 to 15 percent of it i'm like oh i've got all these bloody doggy is in this thing now so i'm gonna to have to go back and hit it but thank you once again for the show you're so welcome it's been an absolute delight spending this time with you really great and thanks heaps lizzie you've, you've been a wonderful guest thanks paulie lovely to meet you and hang with you both <laughs>